Hello everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to CREATE at the University of Sydney. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. We're really pleased uh, to have Anna Abraham with us at the centre today, talking about the work of the Torrance Centre for Creativity um, uh, and, and the work that she's been doing in the festivals and in research and that kind of thing. So we're going to get on to that in a second. But before we do that, I'd like to throw to uh, Professor Robin Ewing, who's going to explain a little bit, bit about CREATE and uh, acknowledge the country that we're on today. Thanks, Robin. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I want to start by acknowledging our First Nations Australians. You will all be on different country. The University of Sydney is on the um, Gadigal people of the Eora Nations country. I'm on Darug country where I'm um, living at the moment. You might like to acknowledge your country in the chat line. I just want to also acknowledge that we have so much to learn from our First Nations Australians, in, especially in terms of creativity and the arts and developing um, a truly art-centred, holistic kind of curriculum. For those of you who don't know much about CREATE, just let me um, remind you that the our acronym is Creativity in Research, Transforming the Art, sorry, Creativity in Research, Engaging the Arts, Transforming Education, Health and Wellbeing. And if you don't know a lot about us, you might like to go on to the, the CREATE Centre website or you might like to go on to the CREATE YouTube to see the kinds of online conferences and partnership webinars that we've been doing over the last 12 to, to 15 months. Um, we believe that creativity and the arts should, should be at the centre of not only our lives, but of all learning. And we believe um, that it's really important that we advocate for that, especially in terms of what's happening in um, some education and, and health uh, sectors at the moment. We partner with arts organisations and other organisations to bring about innovative research and practice. So that uh, that, the other thing to encourage you to do is to join CREATE. If you do, you'll get a weekly e-newsletter which tells you what's happening and profiles important things that are going on, not just only in, in CREATE, but more broadly. I hope that's enough. Thanks, Robin. I don't want to take up too much of Anna's time. Thanks, Robin. Uh, so... The way this will run today is I'm going to ask uh, Anna a bunch of probably um, uh, questions that you could probably do better than me at. So while I'm asking the questions that you're thinking, wow, I could ask a better question, actually do ask that better question. Feel free to um, pop a question into the chat box. And after about 25, 30 minutes, what, um, what we'll do is we'll kind of get your questions, get you to ask your questions to Anna, um, and then we can kind of start to start the kind of discussion going uh, a bit further. Um, but I do want to um, thank Anna for joining us today and introduce her. Uh, Professor Abraham studies cognitive and brain basis of creativity and other aspects of the human Im imagination, including reality fiction distinction, mental time travel, self-referential and social cognition, and the mental state of reasoning. Her um, educational and professional training has been within the disciplines of psychology and neuroscience, and she's worked across a diverse range of academic institutions and departments the world over, all of which have informed her multidisciplinary focus. And uh, so you can see why she would be an easy pick uh, for the CREATE Centre and her work at the uh, Torrance Centre for Creativity and T Talent Development would be really wel a welcome addition to the kinds of discussions we've been having in the CREATE Centre. So welcome, Anna. Thanks for joining us. Um, and do you want to kick off 
really by explaining what the Torrance Centre for Creativity and Talent Development does, who was Torrance and uh, what, you know, what it does and, and, and what it's hoping to do in the future. Right. Um, thank you for having me and thank you all for being here. Um, it's, it's lovely to do a Q&A and there aren't so many creativity centers that I could think of. So it's wonderful, wonderful to be invited here um, for this. Um, I, as uh, Michael said, am the director of the Torrance Center for Creativity and Talent Development, um, which was founded in honor of Dr. E. Paul Torrance, who is, um, you can easily say, is one of the pioneers of creativity research, who did like seminal work in the 60s and 70s. Um, and one of the first to sort of um, come up with ways of assessing creativity, you know, try to quantify what you're looking at. So a kind of interesting way of looking at qualitative responses and deriving quantitative measures from those responses. And he tried to do it in a very um, systematic way, come up with norms and so on for it. His ultimate interest was to try and nurture creativity and try to find out what we can do to basically enhance creative potential um, through childhood. Um, so yeah, his whole life was devoted to that. I can't even count the number of papers. He's kind of um, written thousands of papers, oodles of books and so on and so forth. Um, and the Torrance Center was founded by um, his student and colleague, uh, Dr. Mary Frazier in his honor and to, to essentially um, take forth his vision for what, um, you know, the, the study of creativity can do in, in terms of effecting change and promoting um, creativity in the community. So the Torrance Center has been um, several decades strong now um, and has seen a lot of change uh, over the years. Um, I've started about uh, a year ago officially, uh, but I've only just got to Athens, Georgia a few months ago, owing to COVID. It was just impossible to get here because of all the travel restrictions before. So I've been in sort of limbo for about 10 months. Um, and I suppose um, the, the, the center, what it does is essentially, the title says for creativity and talent development. So essentially we have three cornerstones uh, of what we try to achieve. It's largely sort of service directed at teacher training programs um, in, in relation to creativity and talent development. We also run educational programs for mainly middle school and high school children uh, through the semester typically and in the summer um, in service of creativity and problem solving um, to nurture those skills. Um, earlier it was focused on sort of kids who, I, who were sort of identified as being gifted. Um, we've now, since I've started, opened up to anyone um, who has the right kind of motivation um, to, um, to, and who have a curiosity about their own creativity skills. Um, there's lots of research collaborations that have happened in the past and continue to do so. We do a lot of sort of um, things that are a mix of um, reaching out to uh, do sort of academic formal events and uh, more community outreach events. So when I came in, um, unfortunately came in at the time of COVID, which again, put a lot of restrictions on the normal kinds of things we do face to face. Um, but um, similar to your experience in Create, it opens up a lot of avenues to have things in an online format, it allows you to reach, uh, to not just have a local sort of reach, but a, but a more global reach. So, um, most recently, for instance, I used that as an opportunity to run um, a sort of festival of ideas last, uh, gosh, last month now, uh, just a few weeks ago, which um, was free and open to the global public. We had lots and lots of people from all over the world attend it. And essentially, it's about um, educating people about what creativity is, why it's important, what we can do to bust all the myths around it. And give clear guidance as to how to nurture this um, skill that we all possess, but not all of us know what to do with. Great, fantastic. So I hadn't realized you were so new to being actually in, in situ. How, so, how <laughs> so how long, so how long, did you say, where, where's it actually based? It's based in the state of Georgia. Um, yeah. in Athens, which is not too far from Atlanta. It's the, big, the biggest close by city. Yeah. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. So when you think about the kinds of things that happened in the, the conference that you ran, um, 
and the kinds of debates that are going on in creativity at the moment, can you identify two or three, they might come from neuropsychology, they might come from ed psych or wherever, that you feel are kind of the, the big issues at the moment um, and kind of the, and the kind of research you've seen that, that is making a contribution to the discussions in those areas? Yeah. Well, I mean, it was a really interesting mix of talks. I think the first, in the context of creativity, I think the most, uh, the most um, let's say, most directly related um, um, session we had was, um, uh, was the one led by um, Professor Simon James of Durham University. And they, he was presenting the results of the Dur Durham Commission on, on Creativity and Education. Um, and uh, kind of succinctly described a lot of what they found. And they had this interesting thing of doing these studies before and during COVID. Um, and essentially what they find is, I'm, I'm really not familiar with Australia and the kind of educational, so, so how creativity is valued or undervalued in the, in, in the Australian system. Um, but certainly um, the UK faces the, the problem of uh, the creative industries are extremely valuable even from an economic standpoint but this is not as so recognized at the level of policy and what they're doing is to there's a lot of funding cuts going in in the fields of education to um, um, when it comes to creativity and creative programs um, what i get from i've looked at a lot of these commission reports whether it's the eu with the uk and what i tend to see is that there's this real disconnect between what governments do and what practitioners believe is important and what schools do and i don't think there's um there's any clarity on uh, first of all what we even understand by the terminology what do we mean by creativity and uh, why is it a problem if the arts are being defunded and, and and so on so in all of the talk it was interesting to see this large collective uh, the nice thing about having an on online um, conference and having things like chat windows is that people, you know, write down their concerns, ask questions. And it's quite interesting that everyone's very interested and concerned about creativity and imagination, the collective creativity, collective imagination, where it's going, how the forces of, you know, of politics in the world are impinging on our ability to be creative, but very few people know what to do about it. There's a lot of, I'm upset. Uh, <laughs> And I want some things to change, but there's very little idea about what to change. And what I notice in a lot of these reports is there's a clear need that there's, it's clearly shown that there, it is valued, it is seen as interesting and important. And very few teachers, I don't think you could come across many teachers, at least in the UK context, who would say that uh, this is a good thing to do. Um, however, um, it, there's not much data, <laughs> unfortunately, right, to prove the, uh, to prove the contrary, and this is the problem. So we need to have the kinds of funding, and I think the OECD is doing this sort of research now, but the kinds of things that will change minds in the places that matter the most in terms of funding and taking big decisions that affect everyone's lives means in doing the kind of research that is necessary to show very clearly what our concerns are and why they're concerning, um, and secondly, to think about what to do about it, um, because it's one thing to point out problems, there's another thing to come up with solutions, and the, I don't think there's enough on the latter. Um, so, and that's a much harder problem, and it probably will involve a lot of people across the globe talking and coming up with, you know, brainstorming about what we could do and what's the best way forward. Um, so I think there's a good, it was nice to see that there's a recognition that there's so much that's going wrong, so much that's not being addressed. So there is a clear recognition of that, but there's also the rather worrying um, sort of detail there is um, there's a sense of helplessness and alarm about what to do about it. So, I mean, I think this is something we see a lot uh, in education where there is a gap really between uh, an understanding of the need to do something and a, a kind of clear practical strategies for teachers in schools to actually implement whatever it is that we need in this yeah. case creativity and, and i'm also wondering um that you, you mentioned research and data what kind of research and data is it that we need 
in the kind of the middle of that vacuum, I suppose. You know, if we if we think of the the need on one one end and the actuality of practical processes and classroom strategies on another, what's the kind of data that sits in the middle, do you think, that that we don't have at the moment? I think um the scientific rigor that is called for to make, so we have a sense of all the things that are going wrong, but none of us really know the details of it, right? Like it, things could be much worse than we assume or that we're, we're not even seeing the full picture perhaps. And what you need the data there for is to essentially show you the relationship. So what happens when you, um, how, how does it affect, for instance, your creative capacity? when you stop a program. You need to have longitudinal studies. What happens, uh, what is a comparison of looking at a school district that does things well compared to another school district that um, does not do things well in a way, if, in a way that we would consider well? Um, and what does it show you in terms of outcomes and so on in a way that's extremely well controlled? Um, and, and I think one, there's, there's lots of ways we could go about trying gain research. Some of them are very onerous in terms of costs and, and you know, what it's like to get grants to get the kind of work that we need to get done. But there are also, I'm a big fan of sort of oblique approaches to try and say, well, if it, it might be interesting enough not to prove the la what, what bad things a lack of something leads to, but what good things having something leads to, right? So if we can show that, um, kids uh, who have a certain kind of, um, so for instance, uh, in a study that has recently come out that me, uh, the, uh, I did with a PhD student of mine recently that's just come out this year, we looked at a longitude, we, we're doing a longitudinal study when this is the first leg of the study that we've published, which is to try and look at um, predictors of creative potential in adolescents, um, essentially young to older adolescents. adolescents and, we sort of look at what are the predictors of creativity. So um, we distinguish between sort of individual predictors, you know, things like personality variance, degree of openness, IQ, and so on. And we distinguish between um, uh, contextual variables. So well, what kind of leisure activities do they do? How many creative hobbies, hobbies um, intensity of creative hobbies, uncreative hobbies, um, sort of passive things like just watching TV, um, physical activity, and so on and so forth. Um, so, what we found was that it was, it was really interesting in that it depends on the measure that you're looking at. So if you're looking at something like your ability to generate a lot of ideas, um, there's nothing that trumps just openness, something that's attitudinal, right? That is uh, openness to experience is the single biggest predictor. But if you're looking at something um, like what I call peak originality, your propensity to have many, many original ideas, many unusual ideas, um, then you're not just looking at openness, but a sort of a constellation of factors of openness, in some cases IQ, and the level of creative hobbies. So if we can, sh so that's one evidence that, you know, the, the more you do these sorts of things, the greater your creative ideation in a very specific way, so as to produce original ideas. Um, mm -hmm. We follow them up two years later. Um, we haven't published this work yet, but what we can show two years later is that your level of creativity two years later, your the ability to produce pre original responses is predicted by what you did two years ago, your level or the kind of hobbies you were doing two years ago. Now that's a sort of indirect way of showing it does matter how you're using your leisure time. It does matter what activities you do if it influences your capacity for creative ideation at the point when you're assessing it as well as two years later. So that's the kind of um, that's the kind of evidence that you know to amass very slowly in little pieces like that will be the way forward to make a case for the need for certain types of activities. But of course, we need to have really well controlled studies that look at okay, it's not we're not just look, finding what we're looking for, but testing it against all of our assumptions as well. You know, um, and so I, I think there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, if we had, you know, all the resources in the world, you could do these bombastic, huge studies and try and look at a hundred things. But if you, even if you don't have that, you can look at small things and do it in, and do studies in a sort of neat, well-controlled ways and, 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 and come up with very coherent, even if it's kind of circumscribed findings, it tells you a lot about what we need to be paying attention to. So... I'm really interested in that study and really looking forward to reading the outcomes of it. 
when you came to the point of trying to assess creativity in the context of those participants, how did you do that? Did you use a current style test, you know, uses of a paperclip or something like that? Or were you looking at another way to assess it? And this goes to a broader issue, of course, about how you assess create creativity and creative activity. Absolutely. Um, so in this study, like I said, very circumscribed, almost very limited resources, um, only had time to test people for 45 minutes. So we have to, the, the practical brain comes on to say, okay, what can we get? What, what measure gives us the, uh, as much data as we can get? And so we used the alternative uses task, um, a, couple of, um, um, a couple of trials of that primarily because we wanted to assess them. It's, it's a very well studied task. Uh, I've used it a lot myself. I have a very clear idea of what the kind of controls and the problems associated with that task. Um, and um, it's easy to administer in that kind of chaotic um, environment of going into a school. And you know, there's, there's lots of things that will guide you, but primarily because it also is a kind of task that allows you multiple measures um, very quickly. So we could look at things like, what is the general level of originality? What is your ability to have many ideas? What is your ability to have high, many highly original ideas and so on? Um, it's just a really small slice, obviously, of how to assess um, creativity. Um, but it tells us what we can be looking for if we would do a bigger study. Um, we also looked at creative hobbies um, in terms of what kind of hobbies count as creative. So uh, how often they were doing it, the intensity of it, how many times a week, whether they were doing it in a structured or an unstructured manner. So all of those things were the things that we were looking at in terms of uh, structured and unstructured tells you different things about how motivated um, a kid is when they are engaging in creative hobbies, right? When you're young, you're probably going to be dragged by your parents to do all sorts of, you know, go to this class and go to that class and do this creative thing. But if you're doing that, plus also doing it on your own time, um, that tells you something a little bit more. Um, so this is the first kind of study of its kind that looks at multiple predictors um, and multiple variables. And um, we also looked at a creative cognition tasks. So your ability to overcome the constraints of examples. This is a sort of toy task that was divided by, devised by Stephen Smith in the 90s, um, which we know I've used extensively in previous studies on like neuropsychological studies and so on, and has proved to be very promising. So what we see in this first study tells us a lot about what we should be looking for in, in future studies. And, um, but we always have to be, if we don't find something, it doesn't necessarily mean something is not important for creativity, but we, then we need to think about, okay, what aspect of creativity have we not tapped? Perhaps this is not relevant in this population, right? So I know, for instance, that in the case of creative hobbies, um, we saw this huge dip um, depending on this, the age group you're looking at. So the 14 to 15 year olds were very high in the level of creative ha hobbies. You come down to the 18 to 19 year olds, they're not doing much. They've just entered uni. No parent is dragging them around to do these activities. Um, so if we were looking only at creative hobbies, first of all, we have to account for the fact that if you're only looking at adults, then uh, what we can sort of um, generalize from the adult population may not be the same as what we can look at kids and vice versa. Um, so we need to think about other ways in which we can get at, um, get at kind of a constructs that we're looking for. So in every way, shape and form, when we think about the kind of measures we're using, the main thing is to not be blind about what you're using. Whenever you pick a measure, you have to really think about why you need to use it. There might be, there should be conceptual reasons, but there also might be practical things to consider that we don't really think about, you know? Um, and before I did the study, and it was really worrisome to see how the drop is in terms of their leisure activities of creative hobbies. Um, I wouldn't have ever thought that that would make pick such a huge role, but then, of course, it occurs to you that once you leave the school context, at least the school context is nurturing to some extent, even if there is a defunding of programs. Um, it's, it's really when you reach adulthood that the real problems begin, where you may not have a place to go to exercise your little, uh, you know, your little interests in theater. And, and you know, you might, you might join the theater club if you find that you're hugely talented. But the thing about, great thing about being a kid is that you get to do all these things without necessarily having to be the best person at it, right? You get to just mess around and play around. Um, and that kind of, we lose that as adults. So that's the second thing I would say is that my, my big um, take from a lot of these sorts of events that I've done is um, we're really focused on kids and that's super important, but you know, 
education is a lifelong thing and we um, are living longer and longer. Um, the, the, the feedback I'm just certainly getting from much older people, especially post retire, you know, in the retirement phase, is that there is this real yearning. I see so many people in the kind of workshops that I run who are looking mm. for their, they sort of did it when they were kids and they stopped doing it their entire, most of their adult life. And then suddenly they have this free time and space and, um, and uh, they're yearning for this, to understand this capacity that they once were good at or enjoyed doing. Um, so I think there's a, there's in, in terms of the Torrance Center and where I see it going, I, I definitely see it as education, like I said, as a lifelong thing, um, not just formal, but also informal and serving the community at large, not just people in formal education, right? There's, there's lots of contexts in which people can't be educated or um, in the case of the pandemic, for instance, uh, you sort of saw that the people in the, in the communities that, were, were, that had the highest needs were, tended to be getting the worst kind of services when it came to um, lockdowns and um, you know, what, what in, in terms of online classes and how they were doing and so on. I mean, the, it's so worrisome what's happening. So we need, um, I, I think for me, it's always like a much bigger picture to think, not just here, you have to think that this 14 year old at some point is going to be 18 and then 25 and then, so what can we tell them that's important? What can we understand that is important to understand how our creative drives are going to be shaped and changed and um, for better or for worse? And the kind of research I need to do needs to, needs to be looking at that. And all it's, that's the big picture that I, have to, I try to keep in mind when I'm looking at the smaller things as well. So I'm, I'm really interested in what that says to teachers. And, you know, we talked about that gap. Um, when you think about this research, what implications do you see for um, for a teacher in a classroom or a school or a school district? What 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 would your recommendations for teachers, schools, school districts be coming out of that? Well, I think for teachers, I mean, I'm I'm dying to do this study. <laughs> it's going to be just like a qualitative, open-ended study, but I. I can't presume too much because I don't actually know what teachers have to deal with in classrooms at, at the moment. It's been a while since I was in education and I have not been in like in any kind of school education in, in the Western hemisphere. So um, the kind of classrooms that I grew up in were better and worse in many ways. So I, I think there is no, there's no, there's no one trick pony here. You first have to get a sense of what is the classroom like? what are they being asked to do? What are they being tasked with? I mean, depending on, I, I don't know too much yet even about the American system, but I know that there's this incredible sort of drive towards testing and teachers, are, there's, there's a lot of carrot and stick approach to really making them fear to try and do something novel and just uh, kind of zany or fun in class. And so, um, it will matter what kind of age group you're looking at. Are they teaching primary, elementary school kids, are they saying secondary school kids and so on and so forth. So, the, and what really matters is what your leaders are telling you and what, what, what you know. So I, I would first look at the, the people in charge and look at what their ethos is uh, because the people in charge will really determine a lot about what's possible in, in a school and what's, what's allowed in a school. And the ones that recognize that creativity is really important are the ones that um, you will see creative things automatically happening. And that should probably be the first study to look at how the structural elements um, influence the environment. Because there's only, I mean, you can go to a teacher and say, well, do you want to recognize creativity? And she or he might say, I do or I don't. But honestly, I, I, I don't know why I should have to do this because it doesn't actually I don't know what I would tell the kid. What does the kid get from this? Like there, there needs to be a, um, an ethos where this is kind of um, nurtured and uh, seen as positive, you know? Um, whereas if that's not there, then I think the onus should not be on the teachers so much as having it come, uh, the recognition needs to be higher up first. Um, I, I think that's essentially, um, I, it, I might be biased, but most teachers I know are tend to be rather have their hearts in the right place. <laughs> and um, I think they'd be, um, they're used to dealing with, um, again, in my limited views of these things, they're used to sort of um, 
uh, what do you say, just, just feeding to the brief, like, you know, they, they've given a brief about what they have to do and they, and they do it, right? So if you're given a brief to try and shake things up a bit, uh, they might need some guidance as to how to do that, of course, but then they could do it. And so um, I think if you look at sort of different types of ethos, uh, there are lots of different school systems where experimental systems where things, different things have been tried and um, interesting things have happened in those sorts of spaces. Um, and um, so I, I think in terms of schools, I would think one has to think of it as a sort of, in a sort of systemic, um, in a systemic way. Um, the few studies that have been, have looked at not so much teachers, as at, but as a curriculum, the way you teach something matters, right? So um, mm. there's a Mariel Hardiman, who's the Dean of um, the College of Education at Johns Hopkins a few years ago. She, I think, did the first sort of randomized control um, trial study of schools in Baltimore, where essentially certain schools were um, received um, I think it was science ed curriculum in using arts-based curriculums and the other schools got whatever classic regular type and the only do, and they were assessed in the same way um, the kids at the end of the term um, but during the class in the weeks of study what they did was to uh, the, the way they were taught was different so in the arts infused curriculums essentially um, they weren't just taught things factually you know it wasn't like you know I don't know let's take uh, <laughs> I'm guessing here but um, the planets, the, the, you know, the order of the planets, the way they go around the earth, whatever. They're not just told it, the kids have to, they're told it and then they have to represent it, I don't know, physically or musically or, or a combination of things. And so that was the difference and that's the way the information was taught. And at the end of the day, they all went through the same boring multiple choice tests or whatever. And what, they, mm -hmm. what Mario found was that arts infused curriculums were great for kids who were low or average in their scholastic aptitude. It didn't really make any difference to kids who already, you know, had a high scholastic aptitude because of course they, they, they're good at learning. They, they, they learn well, right? Uh, but kids who were um, not so good at learning, uh, the, they, they, for them, arts infused curriculums were absolutely like game changers if you want. So um, those sorts of things tell you that there's something about the way Think, you know, it's, it's larger than just what one teacher decides to do. It has to be bigger um, than that. One has to take a systemic view of things and then real change is possible. And that, that change is kind of fascinating because, of course, um, what we see in the Australian context often is the arts being cut uh, for lower, uh, lower socioeconomic status schools and a return to teaching to the test often. Um, and from what you're saying and from what this study is saying, the reverse is actually true because presumably uh, the, the kids who are uh, a high, higher achieving are actually getting the arts because they're able to pay for the arts, whereas these other kids are missing out. And then that's more deleterious to, to their development and, and kind of progression through school. I, I'm, that's, that's kind of a fascinating study. Yeah, I mean, I think what I find fascinating about the study was not so much, she didn't look at, as far as I know, whether they were doing the arts on the side. Like we always think of the arts as the extracurricular yeah. thing that they do. Um, they actually looked at a curriculum taught through the arts. So using the arts as a tool to teach. So I, I, I don't know how much you can derive based from, from that yeah. study about arts separate from your curriculum. Like, you know, this is the way we think about it. And that study is fascinating because you can think about, oh, you know, you can use the arts as like, it, make it part of it. I mean, if you're going to cut it, one way to get around the cuts is to infuse it in your curriculum, right? Like that's a smart way to deal with making sure that all the fun stuff still remains in class and making actually maybe math class and everything else that kids might find hard a little more fun um, than just, uh, or even English, whatever it could be. So I think that's one way to get around the funding cut. Um, um, in a really, and so it's kind of like two birds with one stone, use the arts in a way that serves your purposes. Um, but, um, and, and I think it, it, it's, I, she didn't such, I saw her give this great talk uh, many years ago, but she said that what they didn't really um, uh, expect and didn't test for, um, they only noticed it after the fact was that all of these other sort of other benefits that came from that, there was low, 
less bullying there. There was less of every, everything else was also being, there were all of these um, positive social impacts that they didn't think to measure before and after. Um, but you can imagine that that happens because if you're going to work collectively on a problem, you have to touch each other or get, you know, actually communicate or figure out a way to, you know, describe the, I don't know, the, <laughs> the, the, the form of an atom or something, then you have to talk, you have to, you know, you have to engage with each other in a very different way. So um, people who are not normally going to be not speaking to each other at all suddenly have something in common or they might find this thing, uh, this thing that they're doing embarrassing or silly, but then they're doing it together so that it becomes kind of funny. And, uh, who knows what, but there are all of these other benefits to doing that. Um, and so I, I, I thought that was a, that was a really interesting way to think, okay, if the, if, the, if the government is going to take the arts away from us, then we can find a way to sneak it back in, in a way that makes, um, makes sense for us. And that's, I, that's really consistent with some work that we've done at the University of Sydney, uh, the arts motivation research that mm -hmm. showed that uh, young people who are actively engaged in the arts do better across a whole lot of academic and non-academic kind of measure. So I think that's a, that's a fascinating kind of um, loose validation of that concept that, that, that that's happening. And yet, I think we've got some fairly consistent kind of research from the study you're talking about, your work, um, the work of the Torrance Centre, the work of Durham, countless kind of um, pieces of research. And yet, we still see these funding cuts coming through and we still see this, what I see is really um, kind of anti-intuitive uh, reflex to reduce the amount kids have access to creativity in the arts. Have you got a sense of why we're not making, why aren't we cutting through? I think one might be the consist, uh, A, all of these are disparate studies and separate things and nobody's, so I, oh, I'm always surprised about the amount of stuff I don't know that's happening somewhere else. And oh my gosh, they found this thing that's super relevant for us and so on. So there's something about the, I think there are lots of problems, problems at the level of the science itself, the researchers itself, when we're all working in our little silos, we don't really know that there's so much consistency of like these little webs that we can form together. Uh, very often you might be like one voice in the whole of Australia. This is a hard <laughs> this, this, this might be a hard place, right, to be in, if you're, but if you're a sort of a, a wider collective, then that might be, you know, there's, there's strength in numbers, so to speak. So um, finding a way to um, identify the parties, I think, that do this kind of work. Um, I think Peter does this sort of thing, and uh, Peter O'Connor is certainly someone who's looking to bridge these sort of um, boundaries as far as I can tell to try and look at where, are the, where where's the where's the research showing us our, our intuitions are right or wrong or how far our intuitions right and where are we getting it wrong so there's there's partly I think um, to know how this re the, the problem of where this research not where it's published but why we all are not necessarily always aware of everything that's going on um, and finding some way to get people to have the same sorts of conversations that's one thing the second thing I think is our understanding of what creativity is differs a lot, even from lab to lab. So the way we use words is not consistent. And this is the way, this is one way in which um, the message gets lost, right? Um, so uh, that's the second point. Not everyone has a way of, sh um, and, and, and I, there's, I, I think in many ways, there is also the case to be made that we also need to perhaps make the opposite case. The case is always made that the arts are important for the sake of the arts, right? So, but what Mario's work and many other people's work show is that the arts are also really important for the sciences. So, um, so work by, and it's like sort of really indirect work, but there's work by um, the Ruth Bernsteins, Robert and Michelle Ruth Bernstein that show that Eminence in science is strongly related to creative avocations that these people have had. It's, it's mm -hmm. incredibly powerful research that shows that, you know, Nobel laureates, people have patents, the kind of extremely high uh, eminence in science. Um, those people were not just good at science. They were people who had active interests in the arts. And there's a lot of sort of histriometric work that looks at this. 
Um, so the case, I think it needs to be much more made, not just for arts for the sake of arts, but arts for the sake of humanity in general. Um, that needs to be made much stronger. And because of all, the, all of these divisions we have as, you know, the arts and the sciences and all of these things that are actually quite, quite modern, um, we, we, we tend to not see the big picture for what it is to make the case for what we want, you know, um, uh, the, make, the, make the case that we want to make. Um, so I think partly it is, uh, it's a really complex kind of thing that we're trying to achieve, trying to make sense of. Everyone is doing it in their own ways. We're all speaking different languages. Uh, there's not enough of a, you know, a mass for us to promote a, a consistent sort of message. Um, and, uh, you know, and someone higher up has to care about this, right? Like they have to think, well, uh, if, if you can, f that's something data is really important. If you can show sort of consistently that there is um, drops in productivity, the kind of metrics that matter to the center. Uh, and I'm sure that's there. It's just like, you might need to get some economists on, on board to do the kind of really sort of um, hardcore data analysis from the kind of things out there to make the case. But you, you need to have enough people who have the right kind of interest and the right kind of expertise. And this is going to have to be this multidisciplinary kind of team um, to make a case that will be taken seriously enough, I think. Um, but the fact that you know education, although it's there are lots of consistencies across the world. There are also many differences. Uh, whenever, like I'm quite cagey about saying anything outside anything I know because I don't know, right? And I don't want to take assumption, make assumptions about things that may or may not be right. But this also gets in the way of us communicating and, and, and finding a, a common path, for instance, if we all think, oh, this is true of what, where we are, our local community. And sometimes it can be down to like the little districts that we're in. So I think partly it is, um, taking a different look at, like looking at the case in a sort of, in a wider context. So what, are, what does it mean to, why are the arts important? We all know it is, but we just, it's not just about holding a brush and painting, right? Because that's, we could do that in our homes. So it's not in a, that's, that's not it. So it's more thinking about what is it about the arts that is really important? What is it about engaging in this particular matter? What is it about having these facilities? What is it about having conversations? What is it about being embedded in the, con in the, in the environments where this is a way of life? All of that, um, to think about it really widely. And the problem of the kind of research that I do and everyone else does is that we have to go down to like, <laughs> go down to something quite minute. Yeah. And then, um, but the bigger picture is somewhere there and somehow, to make that leap is, um, is not just hard, but very much frowned upon, right? Like to, to jump that way. But I think collective efforts, um, you know, there are very difficult topics that people work on collectively across the globe. It just comes with, okay, there's a need to do this well. There's a need to have us come together as a group to try and affect some sort of change. Very often groups form and it's just about talking and nothing really happens. Um, and things like that. So there's, there's a lot that needs to be done. I just think that uh, the problems come from the fact that this has to be a multidisciplinary thing, which means doing a lot more work to get people from different disciplines together. But it also means that a lot of the, cons a lot of the ways in which different disciplines use language can be lost, uh, can be, you know, we, we can lose a lot in translation there. What's important for education um, uh, specialists might be different for what's different, what's important for an economist or a psychologist. And we, we're all focusing on a different aspect. And we need enough sort of people with a big view, big, big vision sort of of what to be looking at to start to make the kind of changes and the kind of noise that you need to make to, to be noticed, essentially. Yeah, and I think that multidisciplinarity is certainly something that Create's been striving for. I know Peter and his center's been striving for. And I, I think there's a lot, of, um, a lot of sense in what you're saying about how we create the kind of research superstructure that speaks kind of more cohesively to 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 government to policy makers and then finally kind of thinks about how this might kind of engage with educators um i'm gonna call on leon to ask his question he may have further questions uh about your study um leon uh is is one of our amazing creativity researchers in australia um and, uh, and this is also the queue. If you have another question, please feel free to pop it in the chat box. Uh, Leon, take it away. 
Thank you, Michael. And, and thank you, Anna, for a really interested and engaging overview of this particular study um, for presenting today. Um, in, in your preamble, you, you, you were discussing certain uh, terms that, that I'd, I'd like uh, if, if you could flesh them out. Uh, and you were referring to what was called creative hobbies. Oh yeah, God, the bugbear. What, yeah. what did you mean by that? Because I come, I, I work in the Melbourne Conservatorium of Music, so um, yeah, you know, one might define music as uh, as a creative hobby. Yet, um, I can argue that it's it's taught very uncreatively as well. So um, yeah, yeah, and uh, I it's definitely a very good point. Um, I, we did it in the most basic way possible. It was essentially giving a le leisure, I mean, it has to be given to a level at which a 14 year old would understand it. So um, it was just about, um, and the onus was not much. It was just to say, what kind of activities do you do? How often is it with a friend, a parent? How much of it is structured or unstructured? Do you do it on your own time? How many hours on your own time? Or how many hours with a teacher or something like that? And so um, the kind of hobbies that we thought of as creative and we always had like an other things that people could put there what other things that do you do um, so someone wrote creative coding for instance which we thought was a creative hobby as well so but generally we put on all of the uh, what we recognize is the kind of things that kids would do as creative hobbies which is dancing music uh, drama um what else was that um essentially any form of visual art um and so on we gave lots of examples because it's impo impossible to be exhaustive so we just said visual art like you know drawing or painting and so on and so forth and um what we noticed <laughs> was that everyone is a singer <laughs> so we couldn't really code for singing because this must be a new thing in the world um but there was it was it was hard for us to find any adolescent who did not think of themselves as having singing as a hobby. Um, and I don't know if that's a positive or a negative thing or just a banal thing, um, but I did, I, it was not something unexpected. So we had, um, we did think very long and hard about what makes a creative hobby. And essentially it was very strongly coded to the arts and uh, the making of something, whether it's music, but it's not creating something from scratch. And so usually it would be, um, um, what do you call it? Just, just, just going to a, typically going to classes and most of them are doing it in a structured manner. Um, but um, it is, I think if you were looking at older groups, there would be clearer questions to ask there. So are you, um, you know, I would be interested in just the music listening aspect as well. You know, I mean, how many, how much, not only how much, how much time do you listen to, but are you listening to many different genres or just one? Um, things like that, I think, are hugely, um, hugely important. Are you composing music? Are you improvising? Those are two completely different things. Very few people are doing those sorts of things, of course, uh, in child if at all. I know that there are schools that focus on music composition in children, but, um, but it's, um, yeah, so we kept it very sort of basic in a way that they would be able to just tick the right boxes or add a few entries, because we asked them about all their leisure activities, not just creative. We asked them about how much time they spend socializing or shopping or on their phones and on you know, passive forms of engagement like TV. A reading was the hard part that we didn't think was either creative or super uh, or uninteresting. We just kept that as a completely separate category. Mm -hmm. And again, you could think about what are you reading, right? Are you reading a st like in ki among kids, you can say, sure, it's likely to be fiction <laughs> stories. Uh, but as you get older, maybe you want to think about genres more widely, if you're looking at fiction and nonfiction and so on and so forth. So I think there's a lot of interesting things to look at there. Uh, but for the population we were looking at, we're thinking, okay, we want to make sure they answer this accurately, not get bored out of their minds and be able to do it very simply of saying, oh, I do this these many times with mom, myself and, and so on. So it became very simple, but uh, it, it's in some ways too simplistic, of course. Thanks, Anna. You, you also brought up a, a really, look, uh, hard hitting aspect about creativity research, which goes hand in hand with a lot of music research and the benefits of music education. Um, in that um, the, the literature says that it, it, it's relational. This happens in this particular event, so therefore it's related to these benefits. It's, it's rarely a causal, a, effect or a statement that 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 we can really say how do we how might we ad, approach creativity research to perhaps m make those 
links stronger and more definitive in, in the, the causal aspect of, of um, uh, engaging creativity activities in education? Um, I don't know if the causal, I don't know who, who you're trying to convince, but it, it matters who you're trying to convince, I suppose. Um, mm. If you're trying to convince a child, I don't think logic really kind of works too much or just the fact of, oh, if you do this, this is good. Like, so have your vegetables because it's going to make you strong. Yeah. Never, I'll, I'll we're, trying to, um, we're, we're trying to convince the policymakers and the administrators. Yeah, so I think... And ministers it, of there, education. I think there what you need to look... I think they are only convinced by numbers in my experience um, and making a very coherent case. And I think whenever you look at any kind of white paper document, it's, it's kind of astounding to me how unclear it is. Usually in the case of creativity research, or if you're trying to make a case for, people should be doing this more because it's good for them. Um, if I'm reading it even, I wanna see what is the evidence that shows that this, this, it is good for them beyond our intuitions because that's what they need. If they're gonna make any changes and change is the hard thing, nobody wants to do anything to lift their finger to do something new, right? So it better be really convincing. So for me, I think a lot of the problems with a lot of these sort of reports in the creativity realm is that much of it is just sounds absolutely just blah, for lack of a better word. It's just, this is important because this is important. And um, unfortunately, that's not just not good enough. You know, it wouldn't even be good enough if you were doing a, you know, if your PhD student did that and did this and he said, this is, I think this is great. So this is great. I mean, we wouldn't take that as a good way to do research. So um, the same way for policymakers, they, they want actual, I think they can be quite easily convinced. You just need to make a, and we just need a, you might even just need a few case points, right? Of let's say something like the Ruth Bernstein study to say, do you know that they have the study that po points out that people who engage in the crafts more than anything else show that there's this high degree of X in relation to that. And there's actual data point there. Um, and I, that's what, I mean, it's just a summary of something, but I think if, if we want to make a, it's like, uh, I think we need to approach it like a lawyer in some way, you know, which is not just saying, I think this is right. So everyone must listen to me because I think this is right. And that's kind of what we tend to do, um, myself included. So and I get, think that, get rid of the fluffy stuff. Get rid of the fluff and really approach it like, I think if we, we should approach it like we would think we need to drink more, we need to drink water to survive. And you wouldn't say we need water. Don't we know we need water? Like We wouldn't do that. We would actually say, this is how fast the, the human body dehydrates. This is what happens when we don't drink water. And so... I think the way we need to approach is to take this subject, uh, subjects that seem inherently fluffy always have a problem, right? Because they in, seem inherently fluffy. But there are other subjects like consciousness, much, much fluffier in many ways than creativity. And they have zero problems trying to convince people to give them gazillion dollars to test things because they really sort of just zone in on making their case in a really tight manner without saying, ooh, la la, LSD, uh, consciousness, look, this is a spiritual experience. They don't talk about any of that. They're all that way, they all believe in that, I think, but it's like they understand that people who are reading this are not gonna buy any of this. They just want something, and if, if, and if I know anything about policymakers, and I don't know that much, it is concreteness is the key. It, it, they just get, they don't like things that they don't understand. The simpler you put it, the easier. And I would say, take it like a law. Take, go to it like you were a lawyer presenting a case. You know, the final arguments to convince the jury. Um, take out, bring out all the shots, but just as little fluff as possible is, it would be my, my, my approach, really. Thank you, Anna. Uh, that, thanks, Leon. Thanks, Anna. Now, we've got to roll up, but um, last question. If, um, if I uh, had... If you get a lot of money from somewhere, I'm thinking, you know, a Gates, one of them, they've got a lot of money to get rid of. Um, what would you do with it? Like, what, what's the big thing that you would do in your area? Would it be to do the multidisciplinary longitudinal study? What would it be? I think, I mean, if it was any kind of money, then I would probably, what I would do is to open a free school like literally do a before and after study in re like in in real time why would i 
sort of say, well, whoever wants to participate in the school can, um, and I don't mean school, like oh, kind of like an after school thing where we actually test out everything. Why would, you know, that would be one thing to do. If it was endless amounts of money, I would say, do that, just look at direct effects, follow those kids up and see what happens. I mean, the first creativity researchers had this idea, right? Like the, uh, to these longitudinal studies of what changes and what doesn't. And what we found is that really matters, uh, uh, the uh, concepts of what creativity is even changes with time because cultures change, environments change and everything else, what we value changes, what we see as right and wrong changes and so on. Um, I would essentially, of course, longitudinal studies is like the no brainer that needs to be done. And it needs to be done in a really specific way, which is um, looking at, you know, the kind of studies that economists essentially do, looking at all the potential variables together to derive something meaningful that any kind of small analysis study would be completely missing. We don't know about intervening variables. We don't know anything about, you know, what does, does it matter? Um, does reading matter to your ability to provide creative responses? And that is reading influence openness that influences. We don't know any of these really super nonlinear kind of relationships. That's important. But also I would sort of say, just, I would, I have enough intuitions now about what needs to be done. Uh, to try and improve things, uh, what can we do to do that? Um, what, what, what can we do to affect that kind of change? Um, I think, yeah, I, I, maybe the best thing the Gates people and all can do is to sort of just open a whole lot of after schools uh, for not free ones for, ad, I mean, and even things for adults. I'm, I'm actually really concerned about adults as well, because we, like I said, we're really focused on kids. I'm, you know, I, I really wonder about what happened to post 18s who don't go to university or don't do anything. I mean, what happens to the creative? You could have been a star perhaps in school, in your arts group, in your arts department, in your arts classes, and then you stop overnight and it's over. Um, and you don't have the kind of training or feedback system or anything. Um, with a lot of money, you could do a lot, but I think mainly it would be nice. I mean, the things that I can do from my own mind, um, but the big thing to have a big vision is to have enough people together from different backgrounds to inform, inform the, the path forward in, in a fundamental way. And I think that's, but the hard part is finding the right people for the job, finding the right people who don't want to just be associated with, you know, you know what it's like, everyone's busy with best will in the world. Not everybody wants to invest their time, effort, energy, or can. Um, so it's really like trying to find, you know, the kind of people who, think in revolutionary terms and want change and will do, uh, yeah. will, 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 will really uh, put their hearts and souls in it. And I think that's, I, I realize the limitations of what I know. And I realize the need to have a lot of people there who know uh, policymakers in it like, to, to understand what, what you need to change policy, right? Like we, uh, all, uh, having the right kind of conversations, the right people, and the more, the more of a stir you can cause in a, in a way that's actually useful and meaningful. Um, I think that, that, that would be a great thing to do first and foremost. That's, that's a fantastic uh, call to action, Anna. Thank you for, for that. And thank you for the, the way that you've so graciously and generously outlined so much of what you're doing. Really exciting work um, and, uh, you know, more power, power to your arm. So, Thanks so much. Um, all the best with the rest of it. Uh, for those of you who joined late, this will be up on the Create YouTube channel very soon. And uh, have, have a great rest of the night for you, Anna. Thank you for getting up so yes. late for us. Uh, and I hope this is the first of many conversations we can have about how we can make creativity uh, a real priority in our schools and in, for our adults. So thanks so much. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me. Have a wonderful, beautiful, gorgeous day. I've heard it is out there. So have a wonderful day. Right. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>